Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, I'm the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Giacalone, lead pastor, South Hills Assembly of God Church in Bethel Park. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level Ministries in the North Hills area. Well, today on Hard Questions, we're going to take on your hard questions from our hotline. I love this. I don't have to read anything. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. I love to hear these uh, from our hotline. So let's start with this one. My question is, if God was upset because they were building a tower of Babel, how does he feel about us going to outer space? How does that compare? Thank you. I don't believe we've ever had this question. So, Pastor Pete. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the whole idea of Babel, uh, all right, let me, let me get into that first. Babel, it, uh, it, it doesn't compare to what she's talking about, idle space. Babel was complete immorality. It's where they were building uh, this edifice that's going up to the, the throne room of heaven, and it was filled with uh, prost sacred, I don't know how, uh, it's got to be an oxymoron, sacred prostitution, you know what I mean? And, and the whole idea of Babel was, was immoral. So God went down and, and uh, confounded their languages. But us going into space to discover, and, and the, everything about that was pride, it was arrogance, it was all man-focused. But us studying space and going into space has nothing to do with in my estimation, with the Tower of right, Babel. Right, yeah, absolutely. Pastor Glaze. Well, yeah, again, I think that, you know, us going into space is more exploration. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with, you know, us going, in, except, you know, if we're going out there to try to, you know, disprove God, or, you know, we're going out there to challenge God, you know, if that, well, you know, I'm going into space to show that I'm all powerful, you know, and I can shake my fist in God's face, then I, you know, if, if that's the attitude, then that, that's wrong. And but, that was the, yeah. the attitude of the Babel. people of Babel. Yeah, yes, yeah. right. Any other thoughts over here? Yeah, I think um, the, the verse that we're looking at here is Genesis 9, 7, after the flood, where God re-gives uh, the um, creation commission, as it were, be fruitful and multiply, uh, uh, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So God tells him, go out, multiply, right. uh, fill the earth. And what do they do in Genesis 11:4? Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad across the face of the whole earth. The, the actual intention was to disobey what God had just said. Go and fill the earth, spread out on the earth. Let's do this so that we don't have to do what God said. Right. That's why the Tower of Babel was wrong. And it really does come down to intention. I can read my Bible so that I can brag to other people about how much more. Therefore, me reading my Bible is actually a sin because my intention is to use it for evil. So really in the intention, uh, and, and if our intention, as you said, Dr. Glaze, in space is to try to prove there's no God, well, then it's wrong to go into space. But if our intention is just to have dominion and subdue as God commanded us to do and to do it in a godly way, not in an immoral way, then pretty much the sky's the limit. Why? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, good words. point. I mean, <laughs> it's not a sin to build the Burj Khalifa no. here. It's, mm -hmm. it's a sin why we're doing why it. We do why it. we're doing it. That's well, I think true. one thing that's amazing, just as a little side note to all of this, is that the fact that God had to come down and say, they can make this happen. I mean, if you think yeah. about that for Nothing a minute, I mean, yeah, he said, listen, we have to stop this thing yeah. because if, they, if we let them go, I mean, this is not today where we have cranes and we have a rough time building uh, the One World Trade Center. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it takes years. These were people using bricks and mortar and saying, mm -hmm. we're going to build a tower that's going to reach yeah. heaven. And God said, listen, anything they think about, it shows the power of unity when people can come together yeah. and what could happen when people of denominations and churches and backgrounds come together, what can be accomplished with man when they come together like that. So just a side note, when you mentioned about how they were scattered abroad, uh, they, they didn't want to do what they wanted. They wanted to do what they wanted to do instead of what God asked them to do. How when they came together, they had that ability to be able to do that is just outstanding to me. I mean, I'm like, wow, that's, it's hard to believe. It's the Bible and I believe it, but it's hard to believe it. <laughs> but could you imagine happening all of a sudden, you know, yeah, here's uh, people that you know and you now, you don't even understand each other yeah. anymore. It's come Boy, that, ultra that had confusion. to be incredible. Well, let's listen to the next question. I was wondering what counsel would you give to surviving relatives when uh, a loved one of theirs has died 
and no one really knows whether they ever accepted Christ or not and whether they're in heaven or hell. Now, what what words of, I guess, comfort and truth uh, would you give to surviving family members? Thank you very much. As pastors, I'm sure you've all faced yeah. this, this situation. Pastor Jay, will you start us off? Yeah, I just had a situation uh, about a month ago. Uh, there was a guy in my church. He's on his way to church and got a phone call that his son was tragically killed mm -hmm. in an ATV accident. Oh, okay. And uh, his son was about my age in his mid-40s and um, just tragically was killed. And uh, he had been praying for years for his kids to be saved. What was really cool about this is that a month before he passed, he left a Facebook post up and he went and visited a church and thanked the whole pastoral staff that he got saved. Wow. And the father never knew wow. that he got wow. saved. I mean, he looked back though and he said, I wondered why he was so different. And after he talked to all of his family, his family talked about how um, he was just a whole completely different guy. And so just to say that to anybody that's watching, you know, God will leave that little glimpse for you. I mean, especially if you've been believing God for your children, he's going to leave that little glimpse of you to show you that they made it in. And I believe without, beyond a shadow of a doubt that this, uh, this young man was saved. So to, to the question though, if you're not sure and you don't get that type of a testimony with that, um, I tell people this, this is my favorite thing to go to. First of all, won't the judge of all the oh, earth yes. do right? Amen. Uh, the That's second thing that I go to as well is that Jesus did not suffer and die to keep them out. He suffered and died to bring them in. So if he can get them in, Amen. he's going to do it. So that is what I tell everybody. And, uh, and them are the two things that I do for hope for people that they're just not sure. Did they make it? Because people say, what did they do 30 seconds before they died? And all those types of things. I, I can't answer all of those, but I can tell you this. If he can get them in, he will. I, I you know, agree with uh, that, yeah. We had, uh, and you guys may have heard about it on the news, uh, this was a couple of months ago, two kids that died in a fire in uh, Wilkinsburg. Okay. And the grandmother was a member of our church. And uh, you know that was probably one of the most difficult funerals. Mm -hmm. the, the, the little boy was seven and the little girl was six. And, uh, you know, and, and leading up to the funeral, uh, you know, I, I didn't really think about, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how tragic it is. But when I went to the office on the day of the funeral and my secretary had put the program on my desk, with those two little pictures on front, oh, man, I lost it. I mean, I just sat there at my desk and, and lost it. And, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about kids is that yeah. I, you know, I truly yeah. believe that God has made provision, you know, in his word to take, you know, kids into heaven. So, you know, I mean, the words of comfort that I had there was that, you know, that these children were, were in heaven. And so, you know, that from that standpoint, it makes it easy, you know, but then if you don't know, I kind of, I'm kind of like Jay, you know, you, as a matter of fact, and I tell people this, is that you never know what a person did in their lifetime. You know, I, I came from Virginia to witness to my dad because he was dying. And I remember telling him about Christ and he said, well, you know, I've done things this, you know, all, all, all my life this way and I don't want this accepting now that I've come to my deathbed. And, and I, I left there going back to Virginia to believe that my dad was not saved and went to hell. Uh, I came back pastoring here in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is unbelievable. I should have brought the Bible. Somebody came up to me and gave me a, a New Testament, a Gideon New Testament. And uh, in the back, it's, and they thought it was my Bible. And uh, in the back it said, today I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And it said, William C. Glaze. Wow. My name was William R. Glaze. And that was my dad, man. You know, wow. Uh, wow. You know, wow, that is such a great, uh, yeah. that is a great. So, I, you know, my point is, we don't know. We like don't you know. said, Jay, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. if God, if God can get a man, he'll get a man. Yeah, you yeah. know, we don't, we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So just have about 30 seconds, Ray. Yeah. I mean, I basically do the same thing. Um, sometimes you, you don't have any earthly reason to hope. Yeah. But I just always tell people, you, you leave it to God. God is good. God yeah. is going to do what is most glorious and most good. And, and in heaven, we will be praising him for everything that he's done. And you just can't drive yourself nuts with it. Because, I mean, even the people that we think we have good reasons to believe, you know, we don't know for sure. I can never really see someone's yeah. heart. So, 
you leave it to God and trust that God is good. The judge of all the earth will do right and, and, and will glorify him for everything one day and it'll all make sense. Amen. That's right, absolutely. Very good, good question. Well, we're coming back in just 60 seconds when we ask, does there always have to be an interpretation if someone speaks in tongues? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hard Questions. Today we're taking on your questions from the Hard Questions Hotline. I love this. So let's listen to the next one. Hi, uh, my name is Perry, and I have a question for you concerning tithing. The Bible says to bring all the, your tithes into the storehouse. And as I understand it, back in the Old Testament, it was into the temple. So my question is, when you bring your tithe in, does it have to be all to the local church, or can you split it up between different ministries and evangelists and so forth. Thank you. This is a good question that gets uh, asked quite often, yeah. Ray. I know in uh, Malachi 3.10 is the verse he's referring to about bringing your whole tithe into the storehouse and we could look at the different passages and the different ways in which they had tithes of certain crops and so forth and I've heard that it's been uh, calculated that maybe 16 to 18 percent eventually went with all the different tithes, but a lot of those tithes you would bring and then you would get back and eat in some place and have this big feast and invite the Levite. And so you would give a tithe, but it would come back to you. So there's a lot of complications around um, the way the Israelite practice was. And so it, it is uh, difficult to try to go through. And a lot of that's symbolic and ceremonial and fulfilled by Christ. But I think if you go back before all that, Abraham gave a tenth of all that God had given to him because, and it doesn't say that he was commanded, but he did it because he loved the Lord. He gave back to acknowledge that it all came from God. And Jacob does the same thing. If you, you know, when he's going down uh, and he's just, he makes the rock his pillow, you know, Lord, if you bring me back, I'll give a tenth of all to you. And so that's the principle as I see it, that if these Old Testament saints who didn't even know the name of their Messiah, they just knew someday the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Um, if they gave a tenth, the Christian should give at least a tenth. So I don't even go to, you know, where can I find it commanded? The principle out of the love and faith that these early fathers had, they gave a tenth. We should give at least a tenth. And I do think, you know, Paul says, on the first day of the week, lay up uh, each one of you something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. Clearly they were giving in the church. They were giving in the context of worship to the church. And so, yes, there was, they weren't going to the temple anymore. Um, the believers learned that, you know, you don't have to go to the temple to worship God. You worship God anywhere um, because his spirit is in you now. So I do think that uh, it ought to go to the church. I think that you ought to support other ministries, but I think you should give 10% to the church. Okay. Well, and I think, I think the thing he was also talking about was the splitting of it. Uh, and, and, yeah. and some people have a problem with that. In other words, uh, I don't as a pastor. I mean, it, it, the, the church is going to go on. So in other words, some people will want to split the tithe. They'll, they'll want to send so much to the church, maybe so much to uh, CTV. Uh, I don't want to get that legalistic, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was the, 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 the operative word there was splitting of the tithe. Uh, am I wrong? Do you well, you know, I, I, and that's why I would say tithes and offering, offerings, right. okay. you know, that, you know, I, you know, I'm a firm, again, you know, I could get into to a discussion about tithing, whether it's New Testament or not, right. but I'll, I'll leave that for right now. Uh, you know, I, I heard somebody oh, that's say... that's one of my favorite oh, discussions. Right. No, that's all right. Well, you know, I heard somebody say something a long time ago, and I love Charles Stanley. I mean, I love Charles Stanley, but they used an example. They said, if you, you know, give your tithe or you split your tithe and you send it to Charles Stanley, he's not going to come visit you in the hospital. That's you know, he's, he's not going to marry you. you. You know, he's... So, you know, again... Uh, the principle that the person was making yes. was that, you know, that the focus of your tithe should be, you know, your local church. Well, it's certainly. And of course, I'm, I'm sitting here in an organization that is a sort of a parachurch organization, Cornerstone Television, that survives on uh, donations as well. Yeah. So we're certainly asking for people to support the ministry here. How do you how do you slice this up, Pastor Jay? I'm a little bit more dogmatic than probably you would be. I, I believe the tithe belongs in the storehouse. I believe that. Um, and you say the storehouse is the church. The church, church. yeah. I believe, like you said, there's tithe and then there's offerings. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with somebody in our church. They were talking about, yeah, I sent some of my tithe here, some of my tithe there. And I told them, I said, you're robbing yourself of mm -hmm. blessing. Mm -hmm. I said, because what you're doing, you're saying, I don't have enough. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split my tithe 
No, what it is is you have a desire to bless another ministry. Right, right. So you need to put your tithe into the storehouse and then begin to sow above that. I would yeah. say that the tithe brings you the fullness. The offering takes you into overflow. But yes. how can you say with certainty that the storehouse means the church? Because that's what they were doing at that time. When they brought their tithe in the, in the Old Testament, right. they brought it to the place of where the priests were. Right. Originally, the priests, that was part of their inheritance, yeah. was the tithe. So they brought it to where they were being fed and where they were being ministered to. And then also, let me say this too. That it, uh, we, I thought you were going to ask a different question. People will say, well, does it say that in the New Testament? Remember, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees right. in Matthew 23, he said, you ought to have tithed. And he said, and, but you have left out the more ma uh, weightier matters. Yeah. He said, you should have done this. Mm -hmm. So even Jesus said, render to God the things that belong to God, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So, uh, and I believe that the tithe also is the way that it's kingdom economics. Uh, the church needs money. Let's just call it what it is. I mean, you can't, uh, every one of us have a church here, even here. It can't operate without this. So when people sow into that, God's saying, I'm going to set this apart to sow into the work of the Lord. And then the offerings, you put it wherever it is that you feel led. And then I will give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So no question. That, that's, that's my yeah. thought on it. That's, that's, that's good. Well, well, you know what? We're going to leave this. Okay. Because I'm the, I'm the, I'm the uh, guy that thinks tithing's Old Testament, but I tithe. <laughs> okay. So. Well, you're not by yourself. Like a little wiggle What's that? You're not by yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's, you know, because I like what Ray said about, you know, uh, giving that tenth is a, is a good place to start and is a good place to, to support the work of God. Well, let's go on to the next question. My question is, um, why when pastors preach and they speak in tongues, there's no interpretation? The Bible clearly speaks about speaking in tongues and there has to be interpretation. So we have a lot of preachers now who will begin to preach and they will be able to speak in tongues, but it's not... Uh, recognize in that in that language so I have a, that's my question so, I, I, before you answer I don't really know any preachers doing this but go ahead well from time to time it will take place but again if you really want for me clarity it's found in first Corinthians chapter 14 and 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 I believe in first Corinthians 14 Paul is putting the church in order because it was a church out of order mm -hmm. uh, and Paul was telling him that things need to be done decently and in order in 1 Corinthians 14, I see three gifts here. I, th I see tongues and tongues interpretation for the edification of the body. I see prophecy for the edification of the body. And I see tongues for the individual believer. So I, again, I see three gifts here. And he who speaks in the tongue, he's not speaking to men, but God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So we see that. It's very clear. And then Paul goes on to say, I wish you all spoke with tongues even more. You prophesied. So he's giving some clear cut distinctions of what tongues and tongues interpretation is and what the individual praying in tongues. Now, I, I have a good idea what he's talking about. There's sometimes in the Pentecostal circle. All right. Can we can we share some of our laundry? All right. Sometimes in the Pentecostal circle, a preacher will get up and he'll start preaching. And then all of a sudden he'll start speaking in tongues. And I'm, I'm really believing that's what he's saying. And he's saying, well, if he's going to do that, then there should be an interpretation. Time, when I see that happen, I see it more of an exuberance of the individual that's so excited about what he's preaching about that before you know it, he, he may go into tongues. Myself personally, I don't practice that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, because I do believe that. But, but uh, you know, having been in Pentecostal and mostly charismatic circles for the last 40 years, I really have rarely seen that happen. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it's, that's it's really rare. pretty it's rare. rare. Well, that's I think taking it into context too, he's talking about people that are praying in tongues, like they're coming together. And yeah. so I'd get up to address everybody, amen, y'all, and go sit down. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, well, wait a minute. No, that's it, that, that's, I'd that's, rather speak with five words of understanding, right? right? Because exactly. why? Because right. it's going to edify the church. But yeah. there could be some personal edification even in the moment. I'm one of those guys, I, if I get praying and stuff and get flowing in, but there, there are many times if I do that, I will then prophesy okay. right after that. Yeah. I will come, the Holy Spirit will drop something into my spirit and I'll say, I hear the Lord saying right. and begin to speak right. what God has given me in yeah. that Mystery. moment. So, so I think that, uh, you know, if somebody just gets up there and prays in tongues and says, I hope you all enjoyed that. May you be edified. Well, that's an issue, <laughs> you know, that's but if somebody mission. does that for personal edification while they're preaching, but then they're all going through, don't get stuck on that. Well, I know, you know? we have a different, we're all from different backgrounds here. We know, what, what's your take on this, Pastor Glaze? Well, yeah, again, uh, I, I would say that if somebody speaks in tongue in the church, 
uh, kind of like what Pete said, I would ha say there has to be an interpretation. Right. Yeah. You know, you just can't get up and, you know, and, and say something that's meant for the body and not have somebody to yeah. interpret what right. that means. Right. So, okay. In my congregation, what I've always done when that has happened, I always go back to the individual. If there's no interpretation, I'll say, mm -hmm. brother, sister, what do you, and then 99% of the time, what, what they wind up giving is usually. I've actually been in services where the pastor said we're out of order because there hasn't been any interpretation. And then, you know? but then yeah. I, I like to go back to the individual. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Glaze that uh, I, I don't believe the gift is active now, but I do believe when it was active, it would have been improper right. for someone because Paul's clear. There has to be an interpretation. And I have. I've been in a lot of different circles. Yeah, I've been in sure. circles where someone speaks in tongues and then someone else and someone else. And, um, you know, I don't believe that they're doing what the, the Bible teaches. I, th I believe the Bible teaches a miraculous, you know, if I would say, yeah. that would be speaking in a tongue if I didn't already know that verse in Hebrew. But I just said to you something in an actual language, Hebrew. Genesis 1-1. Exactly. So, yeah, I do okay. interpret. And, All right. and, <laughs> you do believe in talking. The interpretation <laughs> is over here. But the interpretation is of a real language and because it was right. a real language. And so that person was actually understanding what the other person said. And that's different than somebody saying something that no one understands and then somebody else saying something that they believe God's giving them directly as a prophecy or something. I don't believe that word interpret, it's a translation. It should be a translation of what that person right. said. So. so, All right. Good, good, good. Important question, important thing to, to think about. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we're going to answer another of your hotline questions. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hard Questions. We have uh, one more audio question for today. My question is, uh, did Jesus turn the water into wine at the Canaan wedding? Or was it just grape juice? Was it fermented wine? Um, a lot of people are telling me that it wasn't fermented. I would like their opinion on this. Thank you so much. All right. And I think a lot of times this comes from, you know, many Christians do not drink and they wonder why would Jesus do this? So Pastor Glaze, what's your, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I am a teetotalitarian, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't drink. But, uh, <laughs> but no, uh, you know what? I, I'll be honest with you, and, and maybe some of the other brothers can bring clarity to this. I just think it's a confusing subject. And the reason that I say, you know, I grew up Baptist, and, you know, Baptists, you know, swear up and down. If you drink that, you know, some of them will even go as far as say that you're going to hell, you know. And, 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 and so they would say, well, why would Jesus turn something uh, into fermented uh, beverage that's gonna cause people to get drunk or that's gonna cause them to sin. You know, and, and they, they don't believe that Jesus would, uh, would turn something like that into an alcoholic beverage. So, you know, I mean, they're, and they're, you know, and I've, 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 believe me, I've studied it out. I've studied the Greek words, the Hebrew words, and some of them were used interchangeably, you know, I mean, so, but then you go to the Old Testament and it talks about wine that makes the heart glad. And, yeah. and, and, you know, so, uh, you know, it's just to me, I just think that, and again, I know I'll, I'm going to get in trouble with a lot of my uh, fundamental Baptist friends. I, I think that you study the scriptures, you pray, and you let God lead you. It's a personal conversation. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you saying then? That it was wine? That it was real wine? Is that what am I saying? Yeah. Was it Welch's? I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, you know I, I'm going to say, I, I'm just going to say, I don't know. Yeah, that's not all I'm saying. I don't mean to yeah. pin you right. down yeah. there or anything. Right. No, 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 no. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm going to go with it was real wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because of that, uh, it says, uh, the scripture says, and it's John 2.10. And he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good right. wine. And when the guests are well drunk. So in other words, they're, they're, they're going, they're on their way. But the culture of that time, it was wrong for a Jew to be drunk. You, you see what I'm trying to say? So I really believe with all my heart it was fermented. Um, but but Jesus, you're saying Jesus turned something that caused people to sin, right? Well, if you believe that drinking is a sin. Yeah. 
That's well, getting drunk is a, we can definitely say well, that getting drunk is a sin. Yeah, getting yeah. drunk is a sin, but, yeah, but yeah, not see, drinking wine. But, I don't yeah, believe drinking wine it, is a sin. It's like, I don't know. It's like overstudying uh, the question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And I don't want to overstudy the question. I want to look strictly at the question. Was it fermented? That's the question. Well, it seems not, to me not, that it, yeah. yeah. Well, not about, that, that Jesus condoned people being drunk. I don't believe Jesus ever condoned people being drunk. But what I believe that wine was for me. Okay, we only have a minute and a half okay. left in the program. Okay. Yeah. Ten seconds. Um, <laughs> just real quick. So, by the way, I don't drink. <laughs> Jesus, you know, to get to get at your point, Jesus creates food, you know, and but and gluttony is a sin, right? Yeah. He doesn't make anybody sin, and I think that that's the difference here. I think um, you you hit on something, Pete. Um, meth, methusko is the word. They were well drunk, and it, it literally means to cause to become intoxicated, to get drunk to become intoxicated with wine. It's from the noun that means strong drink. Right. Um, so, but Jesus doesn't make yeah. anybody get drunk. And I think they do that clearly right. it had to be uh, wine because Welch's, there was a guy named Thomas B. Welch who doesn't <laughs> invent unfermented wine until 1869. Right. It would have turned into vinegar in their climate. So yeah. it, it had to be fermented. I, th I think that's the key. And I think, I think what you said about gluttony and food, God yeah. certainly creates food, but he didn't, doesn't, expect us to be gluttons, so I think that's an important point as well. Uh, so uh, I think we're mostly on the it was fermented uh, side of things here. But, uh, and I can see a bunch of Pentecostals uh, crying. Know, everybody. <laughs> but we like to end the program with the scripture, and today we go to Colossians where it says this, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That's Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Have a great day.